to our next speaker, uh, Joe McMullen, the Deputy Director General of the SK Observatory, uh, who's going to come in and tell us about more about the technical aspects and the construction plans. Uh, over to you, Joe. Thanks very much. Uh, are the slides uh, showing properly? Yes, uh, we can see it full screen. It's all good. All right. Okay, perfect. Okay, so following uh, from, from Phil's discussion, I, I, I want to talk today a bit more about the project and, and essentially following up a little bit about how the um, uh, design in particular has evolved over the long development period. I will talk about some of the technical aspects, although I look around at the attendance and Many of you have uh, strongly contributed to that, and so it'll be good to, uh, uh, to, to use that perspective in, in how we're planning the construction. And so uh, let me just kind of kick ahead, and I want to show a slide that Phil also had up, uh, but I just wanted to talk about it a little bit because the SKA, like other large telescope facilities, is, is ultimately driven by these questions across a broad range of um, astrophysical frontiers. And so th there was this period of, uh, of scientific consultation that, and that led, led to a, a list of, of science drivers. And those were then used to kind of refine and develop the science use cases for the SKA. And the list here, the, the testing general relativity, cradle of life, cosmic magnetism, those are just some of the, the most compelling areas where we think we have an opportunity to drive further the understanding once we have the right instruments. And so the, this is a, a few diagrams that uh, to kind of talk through. On the left-hand side, it's a, a representation of, of some of those key uh, science drivers kind of along the top, cradle of life again that you can see, cosmology, et cetera. Um, and it gives you, again, that sense of the breadth of science cases we anticipate the SKA can impact. And, and, and if, if I had to summarize the goal of the SKA overall, it's, uh, it's the, simply to kind of detect, resolve fundamental astrophysical processes at their intrinsic scales, spatially, spectrally, temporally, um, throughout the universe. So just that, that's all we're trying to achieve. So it is a very broad ambition. Um, and so how do you, you distill that ambition into something that you can actually build. And so those science goals ultimately drive on an engineering design. And so maybe taking the, the cradle of life, which is kind of an area near and dear to my own heart, um, that area, it needs excellent continuum uh, imaging sensitivity in order to see gaps maybe in the, in the protoplanetary systems. Uh, you need broad spectral coverage uh, to be able to disentangle uh, maybe couple spectral energy distributions from the different physical processes. You need excellent spectral sensitivity uh, to detect maybe some of the complex um, prebiotic molecules. And you need spectral resolution maybe to see the motions of the gases, the infall and the outflows, uh, to piece together the real portrait of the evolution. How do these systems actually come together? And then underpinning a lot of that, and it's a key driver in a lot of, um, uh, of the science cases, is the influence of magnetic fields on those processes. And so the polarimetric aspect of that. And so you can do this uh, across uh, and, and, and you can see these um, drivers point to a specific set of technical specifications uh, that are in common. And so now if I, I skip over onto the right-hand side, and I recognize it's a, a bit challenging to read, but the broad features are really what I'm, I'm kind of trying to convey. Uh, and, and what that's showing is uh, along the bottom uh, on the x-axis, if you will, is the, is the frequency coverage. And along the y-axis is this range of uh, science uh, areas that we, we think we can influence. And you can see uh, the green bar along the top, hopefully you can see my cursor, is showing the, the low frequency coverage. And then the red bars are illustrating the receiver bands within mid. And so it kind of shows you how this, um, the, this the influence basically of the science on the determined frequency range for the observatory was established, how we begin to put together uh, the overall design into something that actually uh, 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 fits what we, what we really need. And so you generate the set of technical requirements, uh, but looking on the left, you have this lovely triangle of you know, scope, cost, and time, and, and, and these are practical considerations that are in play. And of course, an overarching driver on quality. 
Um, and quality is especially uh, important too, is because we're, we're producing so many similar components uh, in the architecture of, of an array and of, of an interferometer. And so looking on the right, um, trying to capture the interplay of the, the drivers with the realization. And so the, the observatory, and this is a key feature of the SKA, is it's not an experiment. It doesn't have a pared down set of requirements to execute an experiment. It has a set of science frontiers to explore, but there is also this unknown aspect and the, and the emergence of things over time. And so a, a broad set of capabilities are really what you're, you're looking for. And that's what we're trying to kind of balance uh, over a rather long lifetime. And so, um, you know, the configurations as an example, you know, there you're trading between, you know, infrastructure costs and the need for the, the, the science cases, the UV coverage, the beam characteristics and the imaging qualities. And then similarly for the antennas for, the, for, the, for both facilities, there are key drivers uh, that set them up, either the, uh, the, the bandwidth ratio or, or the, the um, uh, unobstructed aperture that drive on specific design details. But fundamentally, the question is, can you build it? Can you deploy it? And can you operate it? Uh, does it fit within the environments that we're building? These are remote and challenging uh, areas, quite distinct from the lab setups that we begin the testing. And given the the expansiveness, you know, broad over a, a, a large range, distributed over tens of kilometers, um, and the, the remoteness, the quality attributes again really come into play. And so this is sort of the design strategy that I think we've adopted, supported by many of you, uh, to get to the point where we are uh, today. And another aspect, of course, is that uh, we're, we're aided by a lot of, uh, of precursors who are or maybe not um, architecturally identical, but they're, they're, they paved the way, they've illustrated technologies, they've illustrated techniques uh, that can be used and, and that has supported the design path that we've taken. And so you can see so many of these, but uh, along the top hand, uh, these are the operating instruments that are really direct precursors from you know, ASCAP and uh, 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 in, in Australia and MWA in Australia and Meerkat and Hera in South Africa. These have really illustrated a lot that we've learned from, try to take some of those lessons and integrate them in that design process, our own prototyping process to come up with the, uh, with the final design. And this is just a uh, kind of the summary, um, uh, the history, if you will, it's taken us a long time to, to get here. And this shows the, the commitment of, of literally hundreds of scientists and engineers uh, as represented in each of the member country uh, institutions driving forward and, and, and uh, going through that process of elaborating on a design, trying to qualify it, and then us trying to put all of that together uh, in the end. And so maybe just to kind of once you do have the, the, the sets of requirements, the, the way we, we really broke things up was through the help of these different institutions and different consortia, collections of these institutions came together to deliver on aspects of the overall observatory, subsystems of those that could be captured, tested, and then uh, handed over. And then we could kind of assemble that as the overall. And so uh, the, the worry that we had, of course, and that, that did take some time is that it's, it's a little bit restricted or narrow in the sense of how does all of this connect together? And so on the right-hand side is kind of illustrating the fact that we went through a further process. We were able to step back from um, the individual components and look holistically at the observatory as a system, challenging on those designs and ensuring that there were gaps that all the interfaces actually worked out. And this process took well over a year to, to come through. Uh, and then going through a standard you know, system level, a critical design review process, panels of experts coming in who have their own scars from their own observatories to polish and improve on things, developing um, and finalizing that design, but also finalizing on a lot of those programmatic aspects, making sure that uh, it all holds together. And it's something that we can deliver to our community in a relatively predictable way um, to meet their, their expectations. And so this is one, Phil also showed uh, this slide, I'm kind of emphasizing maybe a little different aspect of it. So this is uh, you know, the, the summary architecture of the observatory overall. And a lot of what the construction project is, it can be summarized in the green. Uh, these, these areas are really 
what we're building with the uh, SKA-1 and, and these sort of blue or pu purplish boxes that Phil was emphasizing, those are deliveries um, provided by the host countries, but really critical to the overall function and operation uh, of the observatory. And the black lines kind of connecting things are showing sort of the data flow and talk a little bit more about that. And the red lines just showing the overall coordination with the headquarters and the uh, host country facilities uh, on the ground overall. And so this then is good. It, it just shows what the facilities will look like. On the top is the um, SK-1 low in, in, in Western Australia. You can kind of see the location of the site about 600 kilometers um, uh, northeast of, of Perth um, uh, for reference. Um, and uh, you know, with baselines uh, up to about 65 kilometers and the facility is operating across this continuous frequency range from 50 to about 350 megahertz. And the right hand side shows what that array physically looks like, you know, maybe uh, more distinct, for, uh, uh, very distinct from mid, uh, where we're using these long periodic antennas, uh, which are coupling many dipole uh, antenna elements together in a ladder to, to achieve that broad bandwidth. That was a, a key driver. Uh, these are then combined in these circular um, uh, arrays that we'll, we call them the stations and 256 antennas uh, in a particular station. You can see these are an older prototype where we had some uh, uh, some different foundations for the individual uh, antenna elements. Uh, and then 512 of these individual stations to kind of make up the overarching uh, sensitivity and capture the uh, uh, the, the capabilities that are needed for the, the science cases. And so it's, it's really, it's, a, it's a, a long wingspan, if you will, of fiber and cable across the deserts. There are kind of 37 individual buildings, uh, you know, 36 small ones and one big one uh, that, are, that are there um, and uh, all of the infrastructure associated with that. So really the, the thing that I think we forget sometimes in astronomy is we're not building observatories, we're really, really building small cities. Uh, that have to have all of that functionality, all of the support uh, to be uh, uh, operational over that period. And so then on the bottom, of course, is the, the, the mid facility in the Karoo region of South Africa, and that's about 450 kilometers uh, northeast of, uh, of Cape Town. Uh, and it shows the, um, the, the location of the array. And this one is distributed over even a, a longer uh, uh, maximum baseline, about 150 kilometers. And this one now is operating from 350 megahertz of picking up from low all the way up to about 15.4 gigahertz. Um, right now, I should point out, we have some of the frequency bands that are designed into the system, but are not provided in the first uh, uh, delivery of SK-1. Those are bands three and four and, and 5C in particular. And on the right-hand side, you can then see the individual um, uh, antennas, kind of that those structures being put up. So it's really composed of 133 of these uh, 15 meter uh, dishes coupled with the 64 dishes that already exist. These are 13 and a half meter dishes uh, from the Meerkat Observatory making about 200 dishes uh, over that uh, uh, full extent. Oops, sorry. And so this then is showing, um, uh, again, a little bit more detail. So, so graphical representations of low on the left and mid on the right again. And so just allowing us to zoom in uh, on some of the details. So the left-hand side showing the, the sort of the three spiral arm distribution of the stations and then zooming in to see the clusters of the stations and, the, and how the core is arranged. You can see the collections of six stations per cluster. And then looking at an individual set of antennas uh, driving through to look at the, um, uh, the, the data flow and the connectivity all the way through to the uh, Science Processing Center. And then as Phil noted, uh, to the SKA um, uh, 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 SRCs basically uh, that are uh, uh, distributed more globally and handling sort of that curation and um, uh, distribution to the, uh, to the communities. And then similarly on the, on the mid side, uh, there again, seeing the sort of uh, uh, spiral pattern, you'll, you'll notice there are two different colored dots there, of course, uh, again, noting that the, the meerkat antennas are really concentrated toward the um, uh, core of the array, uh, but that it's the overall combination that's being used there. We're exploiting the existing facilities that are on the ground that are supporting uh, the, um, uh, 
Meerkat Observatory, and then again out connecting to the Science Processing Center, then off hopefully to our, our community of users. And then this is just showing um, snapshots of, of uh, uh, the existing status that, uh, with regard to the prototyping qualification and, and the, uh, the state of the designs. This is a, um, uh, a verification system that was deployed uh, in the Murchison right around where the, the observatory will be. And this is showing kind of the, the scale for this, this sort of fourth iteration of this prototype antenna. Uh, that's been tested and has uh, performed really robustly uh, in that environment. And then on the right hand side is the second prototype. This is the uh, prototype provided through a uh, Max Planck um, uh, support with uh, Soreo, uh, working again with all the partners, Stetsi and, and Sam in Italy, uh, to produce one in that environment, actually on an SKA foundation, and that's still being tested and reviewed for uh, all of its properties. But uh, a, a lot of work has gone on to um, characterize and capture, um, you know, in this pre-construction phase, the uh, performance of these uh, uh, prototypes to help us inform moving ahead into construction. What is the manufacturing? Are there any lessons, final tweaks in the design that we need, knowing that we have to roll these out on a, on a fairly significant uh, uh, scale. And so the, the next is, uh, I'll just kind of throw in uh, some of these, that's not just the, sort of the big structures and the disk structures, the antennas and the stations, but a lot of the components, a lot of the pieces of the system, if I had a block diagram, a lot of those have been prototyped uh, in detail to make sure that everything is, is uh, really going to perform as we need it. And so uh, the different receiver systems for mid band one and the um, uh, the uh, cryostat for the, the 345 and then band two. And these have been tested and I think are really in a, in a, in a good state to, uh, to advance. And then racks of electronics that uh, have been deployed in support of the stations. And then um, uh, uh, correlator board representations, prototypes for the, uh, uh, for the low and mid as well. And then of course, we've got um, in addition to um, all the, uh, uh, the hardware, there's also an immense amount of, of software uh, that's involved in the observatory, very much an observe, uh, a software instrument as a way to look at it, uh, integrated in every, every aspect. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing in the project that, uh, that I think Indy in particular uh, is, uh, has helped us pioneer, been on the vanguard of, of, of that approach is, is the Scaled Agile Framework. Um, suite of processes that we're using to develop our software. And, and this diagram is just kind of showing how that's really uh, meant to work. Basically, it's predicated on putting things together early, uh, testing constantly, and going through the process iteratively, and, and then slowly adding on the functionality, but not, not having that uh, uh, maybe more traditional waterfall approach where you establish a set of, of requirements at the, outs, uh, at the very beginning, and uh, you hope you get back what you needed many years later. And instead, it's, it's really coupling uh, the developers with the owners, those that are invested in the results all the way throughout the development process to really make sure that you understand uh, what it is that you need all the way throughout and, and maximizing uh, uh, what is the highest priority at every step of the way and kind of doing that on, on, a, on a rapid, uh, rapid loop. And so, and then this is just kind of showing a bit more about an architectural view of, of one of the um, minimum viable products, these MVPs. And then I've got some GUIs here uh, in operation. I can see that I was paralyzed by the immense amount of, of things I could do. There are ongoing demos uh, through every PI cycle and they're going on right now with the OMC and, and SDHP. Um, uh, but just showing a few of those, I picked some older ones. Uh, and then this is a, uh, another one of the GUIs and one of the racks. This one's actually been deployed at, at uh, Meerkat, uh, but showing some of the uh, uh, test data from the uh, pulsar timing, uh, uh, showing one of the pulsars and, uh, and, uh, and the actual Shapiro delay that was detected. And so these are working systems now that we think um, uh, that we can model on uh, for the full production and into the uh, uh, construction phase. Now, Phil covered this uh, as well. The amount of data, uh, I, I wouldn't call it an issue. I would say it's a challenge. Um, but it's uh, uh, ultimately, we're, our, the observatory is so driven by a large body of interconnected software systems. Sorry. 
Thanks. Um, and, and so uh, many of those systems are, are, are very functionally recognizable to, uh, uh, to you from other observatories, the science management side, proposal handling, observation design, scheduling, execution and tracking, um, the monitor control, um, the, the real-time coordination of hardware and software systems that collect the operational um, support data, uh, and then the acquisition of the science data, the science data processing, the calibration, imaging, time domain analysis as appropriate. And then in, in trained in all of that, of course, is the, the, um, uh, the, the business or enterprise systems that support the functioning of, of maybe those non-science aspects. And so the, the, as you saw both from Phil's di uh, diagram and mine, if you look at the numbers, the data processing becomes exciting uh, when you're on the scale of an observatory like the SKA. Um, and uh, the, the data rates coming off the antenna systems with a little bit of processing on site in particular for the, the low array, um, but they're, they're still fairly extreme. And then the transport to the science processing centers where the standard data reduction has to, has to take place. And I have slightly, I think, different numbers from Phil because mine is really um, based on uh, a weighting of the expected science objectives that will evolve. I think Phil was representing what those maximum maximum um, uh, data rates uh, could look like uh, over time. Uh, but these are, again, these are things that are going to evolve. We need an architecture uh, that, uh, you know, at some level is modular and supports that, uh, you know, kind of emergence of areas uh, to be able to adapt to that. I think that's what we have uh, going forward. So now is the exciting part. So, um, um, Bill did talk about the schedule a little bit, and I, and I can go back to uh, maybe some of the questions that uh, were had, if there's still more around that. You can see on the left-hand side, this sort of course breakdown of, of, of how um, incrementally the observatory is laid out. Basically, the program for construction and handover is about eight years, and that includes the time to build these incremental uh, array assemblies, that is these subsets of the interferometer. We build them fast, we build them early uh, as we go throughout. And alongside on the right-hand side is, is, is a bit of a rollout plan. You can see these array assemblies and, and on the low side, the number of stations involved. And on the top is sort of a, a subset of the uh, observing modes, if you will, uh, that we're looking at to kind of incrementally get to a point where we can test these demonstrate them up to the full science requirements uh, that are needed and do that over a period of time, kind of looking at the system challenge, get making sure that we're on the right trajectory and then hopefully ultimately uh, uh, delivering that. Um, the question about when do we have uh, data uh, that'll come out, I think Phil did answer that, but the idea is that uh, there is engagement with the community throughout this process. And as we get to a scale where facilities are kind of on par with existing facilities, then we can use public releases of data to help us guide through that final execution phase and the subsequent delivery of the observatory. And we can use that to kind of uh, channel us to what the final, um, uh, the, through that final science verification. And so this is kind of showing the ambition that we have in terms of the subset of observing modes. There will be many more of these. They become richer over time through the operations uh, work that's going on. But looking at this, this is what we think we can deliver and test kind of continuously, repeatedly, getting to the point where we, we feel good about uh, that delivery. And then Phil did mention, of course, that uh, that eight year does include um, some contingency. Things don't always go according to schedule. We know that there are known uncertainties built into our planning right now, and we have to manage to that over time. And that gives us some of that ability to manage so that we're aligned with the expectations of the community. We're not telling them, oh, we're gonna be late, we're gonna be late again, we're gonna be late again. We're trying to build within a predictable framework. If we come in a little earlier, that's great. But right now I would argue that that, that contingency that's in there is actually needed to provide us the ability to manage the many different things that are gonna go, um, uh, go in the execution of the, uh, uh, of the project that are gonna challenge that in the timelines, conflicts between contractors or, or uh, just it takes longer to do certain things as we go. And there are you no know, uncertainties in that, 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 that we basically we've planned in. And so this is the, the low representation and here's the, the mid representation kind of similarly aligned. Uh, you can see the different number of dishes in this case. And so a small number four, you know, kind of that, that subset, that, that minimal uh, system, if you will, testing out 
uh, the basics of the phase closure amplitude closure does the system uh, is the system integrity uh, all there and then kind of rolling it through where you've got partial implementations to the full implementations and even now, uh, even indicating there are some areas where we can strive for it, but maybe we want to chain, uh, attain it at an earlier stage, but it gives us an idea of what we, what we can try to plan to and what we might be able to uh, produce in terms of those uh, early uh, bits. Um, all right, so go here. I felt like I needed to put, to put on something. You can't uh, probably see this, but you'll have it in the slide representation, but it's just kind of trying to capture in a very summarized way the set of technical aspects that we've designed together uh, that the SK1 will be able to deliver to our, our community. Uh, the red bits are just highlighting again those designed in uh, but not planned in parts of the SK1 for the mid. Uh, that isn't the case uh, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the low observatory. Um, okay, and then here, uh, this is just um, a, a roadmap like schedule that's kind of showing where we are right now in our planning. As Phil indicated, uh, our intention is to begin construction in the middle of this year. And begin construction means that we have the permission to do so. We have some funding to, uh, to begin that process. Uh, and we can begin to procure, we can begin to award contracts uh, for the many different things that we have. And, and because this really is a system, our contracting is fairly complex up front. And so there's been a long preparation stage of us getting together all those contracts groups so that we can uh, be ready for that first burst of, uh, of both advertisements, uh, looking at uh, what areas are gonna be competed for versus which ones we think we might sole source given the uh, historical investments and being able to drive forward. But it shows you the, the history of what we've gone through to get here. And then basically where we are right now, where we've had our first council meeting and now we're going through and uh, refining our plans up to the point of hopefully getting that approval potentially uh, in June to start in, in the July uh, timeframe. And so maybe um, Phil also showed this, uh, but just kind of noting again that the, the investment overall is substantial. The construction side of it is, is, uh, is, is above a, a billion euros to get through that uh, and an overall investment over this 10 years. And I think what's been a strength of the SKA, again, learning from other other observatories is you don't isolate the construction and the operations that have to be uh, very tightly um, uh, coupled in the planning stages so that you have a coherent observatory. You build what you can operate. And I think that's what we have here. And, th and the view of this is that this is a coherent whole uh, that we have uh, going forward. I would note there is an area. So um, one of the questions that came up is, you know, the, the future development. There is something that we have tried to build into the ESKA planning, which is the fact that the lifetime is 50 years. It's got to evolve over that period of, uh, of time. And so there is a development program that looks at a technical roadmap, a scientific roadmap, these emerging frontiers and enabling technologies as they come available. How might they be able to support enhancing the capabilities over that lifetime of the observatory? And there's an investment made by the members to making sure that we can do that. Uh, going forward. And the last day, again, I would say Phil showed this, but I, I just kind of wanted to um, emphasize the fact that this is a, a large research infrastructure. It's really hard to do. And so how do you do this? Well, we can look at how they've done others like Alma and, and uh, other examples like that. But generally, they, they, they take a significant investment and it requires the collaboration of countries and institutions to come together to pool not just their funding, but their expertise, their knowledge, and their uh, you know all of all of what they've done before, pulling all of that together to build a new facility. And the SKA is very much built on that model. So it does have uh, currently 14 uh, member countries sort of in the organization, and then two more that are are looking to jump in uh, and and, uh, and and joining. And that makes up uh, really what we think we need. And I would say that. India has been critical throughout this process. It, is, uh, it, it permeates the areas both in the design stage and now in our planned construction for the delivery of the observatory. And that the expertise that's been developed within India is needed for the SKA and, and uh, is, a, is a core pillar uh, that supports the work 
uh, that we're uh, hoping to do in the coming years. So the summary slide is just that we're basically done the pre-construction phase. It's time to get to work, which is maybe hard to say given how hard it's been to get to this point. But we are anticipating a start of construction in 2021. I want to kind of just put on the bottom a little bit. It's, it's a big investment. It's a long time. It's a lot of, of funding from a lot of different governments. Um, but just maybe in a, in a very you know, visceral way, looking at what the promise of the SK is. And you can see these on the, uh, there, there are two pairs of images on the right hand side of each pair is sort of a representation of what a sort of the state of the art observatory can do right now, looking at a particular image in the case of here of, a, of the, the Pratt Nebula, and then what the promise of the SKA could actually deliver, kind of almost amazing fidelity, imaging uh, fidelity and capture. And it's not just the taxonomy or the beauty of the images, that's nice, but that's the detail that's actually needed to make the breakthroughs and understanding the physical processes. And that's where we're really driving on with each of these. And so that's what the SKA one is. And uh, I, I think I'd love to take some questions. Thank you, uh, Joe, uh, for, for an excellent talk. Uh, we will now open, uh, we're now open for taking questions. So uh, with those on the Zoom call, uh, you, may, uh, you may just raise your hand uh, so that we can ask them in order. Uh, if you prefer, you can also post them into the chat. And for those of you who have joined us on YouTube, uh, please uh, go ahead and comment uh, as a YouTube uh, uh, comment, and we'll we'll pick up the questions from there. Given there was a, a latency in the questioning, I won't presume that I was crystal clear. Yes, yeah. We, we once the questions start, uh, let me let me while we wait for other questions, let let me kick off with a question. Uh, the 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 cost table that you uh, just showed uh, are, are these uh, two thousand twenty euros or in some other. Numbers. Yeah, that's a very en enlightened question. Yes, yeah, so anytime someone shows you currency, you better ask the units of that. And you're exactly right. Those are 2020 uh, uh, euros. And so the uh, program does have built into it uh, a regularized uh, escalation and uh, adjustments. Uh, there has to be some kind of correction. So there's a windowing process. So we'll do this sort of annually. Uh, as we go forward with maybe a part projection and then we'll correct that projection in the subsequent year. So overall, the, the escalation should be tracking uh, what we're really experiencing on the ground as we go forward in the observatory. I've got one question in the chat I could begin to answer if that's okay, I guess. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, are the prototyping activities concluded? That's a, that's a, a bit of a tricky question. It, it's sort of yes and no. I, I think we've gotten to a state across a large part of the design where we're quite com comfortable, I would say, advancing toward the uh, procurement stage. Uh, there are other areas, I think there are uh, design refinements, design maturity for production uh, that we'll want to build in. And those are activities that we can take up and had planned sort of the design build type contracts in some areas to do some of that refinement uh, as needed. And we've got some additional uh, work going on from some of our partners to do that actually early, even before we start a construction, which is fantastic because that, that really reduces risk. Uh, we do have two outstanding areas that, uh, uh, that we're still working on. And, and, and one is in the, um, with prototypes, you learn things. And we did find some non-compliances in our final deployed uh, prototypes in the low array, in particular in the areas of the power and signal distribution. And it's, it's a very solvable problem, but we're deciding on how we want to solve it and then finalizing that design. So I would say that prototyping effort 
is still going on. That will actually carry on through the summer of this year where we'll, we'll deploy a revised prototype uh, and make sure that everything looks good before we kick into the production. And that's still within the schedule, but the prototyping effort is kind of, there is a part of that that's going on in tandem. And the other aspect is, is maybe more significant uh, and that's uh, in the area of the mid-dish structure. And I, I mentioned that we've had two prototypes, one deployed in China, one in, in South Africa. And of course, again, we did learn things there. And, and one of the earlier questions was on the uh, RFI situation. One of the big worries we have is, is self-generated RFI, that is from the electronic systems within the SKA itself interfering with our observatory. And so that's been a tricky uh, problem to disentangle. We had the benefit of having a working observatory there with Meerkat. And so there is spectrum management happening there that helped us understand the issues and those have been uh, uh, resolved essentially and had to go through a, a subsequent refinement stage and redeployment and, and qualification. And so I think we're, we're getting to those stages. There's a long lead time on some of those uh, uh, aspects in the in the mid dish systems, um, but right now we're still looking to kind of finalize the design over this year and have them you know on schedule for when we need to let the contract to go forward for the procurement. But uh, so there is there is still some ongoing prototyping activity. Is a shorter answer. Yeah, Dipankar, did you want to follow up on that? Let me unmute myself. Yeah. Uh, no, I was wondering whether it, uh, just when you say that we start construction, all systems are fully designed and a go, or is there some refinement still happening? Because you, uh, right in the start of the construction, all subsystems are probably not being constructed simultaneously. So is there some phasing there? That's, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, let, let me take that. So the, the, re, the reality is that we actually need to go pretty broadly across the, the spectrum of the systems, what had been traditionally the, the consortia, pretty soon out of the gates because our, 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 our maybe laser-like focus is on that earliest representation of the array, that, that array assembly 0 0.5, which is just a few stations and a few dishes. Um, in both the uh, low and mid facilities. So we really do need to go forward very quickly. With that said, where we were at the end of this long design process that I described is we have a reference design at that point. And so we are, uh, and so you can, you can argue language at some level here. Are you a build to print observatory? That is the, what, what, what we've got at the end of that, you just make some of that, or are you a build to specification? And I would argue that we're largely a build to specification that this process has revealed the specifications that we need. And we have a reference design that illustrates qualified designs that can meet those specifications. However, we've done these in, in some cases in small labs and, 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 and even academic institutions. Now we need to produce and take the case of antennas, 131,000 of them. And so there, there's a, a design aspect of the production uh, runs that we need to, to make, that scalability. And so I would say that uh, I use the, the phrase design build, but in some of these cases, and even infrastructure as an example, infrastructure we, we well understand, but do we have it down to every bolt and, and, um, and, uh, and dollop of, of concrete? No, that's a process that we'll go through. So uh, in, uh, take, uh, take maybe infrastructure as the example. We'll award an initial contract right out of the gate that is providing professional services that's supporting us in areas that the observatory is not uh, uh, not uh, skilled at in terms of uh, uh, those those attributes. And basically, they'll help us in the contracting of the downstream. So it's all the um, uh, aspects of the buildings and the utilities and things like that uh, uh, going forward. But they'll also, in the process of doing that, they will do a final design, kind of carrying that all the way through down to the lowest detail that we'll do a review of before we go forward and, and do it. And that period takes about six months. And so even though we start construction in July, you know, we'll have maybe camps on the ground beginning at the end of this year and then real things happening sort of in the beginning, uh, you know, first quarter of 2022 is the reality of the situation because of that design finalization going forward. And that's similar in other areas as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you.
I can see uh, a few questions coming in on the YouTube channel. Uh, the, we, we can take one here, which is, the, will the SK also work uh, in uh, collaboration with the VLBI? This is a question from Pranav Limay. Uh, short answer there is yes. Uh, that's That's been something that has been um, incorporated into the design considerations all the way throughout, and we've kept that coupling. And so that is in an observing mode that is uh, uh, an aspect of our delivery and is in actually a part of the, the initial delivery uh, for the, the start of operations. Okay, uh, there's one more question on, on from YouTube. Are there features of the GMRT that SK will uh, take uh, inspiration from? I think broadly, yes, that's the case. Uh, I, I think all of these um, uh, precursors and predecessors illustrate a, a lot of the aspects that we have to, to uh, realize in the construction of the SKA from how do you go about uh, uh, building these complex uh, integrated systems and how do you test them? And so the lessons learned, I think, are often in this incremental testing as you go, putting the systems together uh, demonstrating them. Now the GMRT, uh, you know, the, the scale of things is different, but the lessons still uh, 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 still apply. And then other areas, uh, I would argue, are in terms of just the operations. How do you operate these facilities and maintain them over an extended period of time? How do you learn to uh, enhance uh, their their facilities to maintain relevance to the evolving scientific frontiers? All of those are, are things that we have to continually reassess and reevaluate in our process improvement, uh, borrowing from, from facilities like the GMRT. So that's that's the very broad way of looking at it. I'm sure there are more specific examples I could give as well. I mean, if I may add a specific example, we, uh, we, uh, we use the, uh, the Tango uh, framework to design and build a new monitoring and control system uh, for the GMRT. And this is effectively going to be a prototype for the design of uh, the full SKA monitoring and control system. So that's one example of, a, of something specific that was uh, first uh, tried out and demonstrated to work at the GMRT and which we hope uh, will, will also work for the SKA. And, and maybe just to note, that's not a small example. That underlies the the, the fundamental architecture of the uh, uh, of the control system for the SKA. Are there any further questions uh, from the Zoom participants? Okay, so I think we can move on.